life is a hideous thing. And sometimes, from the background, behind what we know of it, peer hints of truth which make it a thousandfold more hideous. I mean, science, already oppressive with its revelations, will perhaps be the ultimate exterminator of our human species, because its reserve of unguessed horrors could never be borne by mortal brains if loosed upon the world. If we knew what we really are, we should do as Sir Arthur Jermyn did. And Sir Arthur Jermyn soaked his clothes in oil and set himself alight. No one placed his charred fragments in an urn or set up a memorial for Sir Arthur Jermyn because certain papers were found and a certain object in a box which made men wish to forget. Even today there are men who knew him who will not admit that he ever existed. Arthur Jermyn burned himself alive out on the moor after seeing the boxed object which had come from Africa. It was this object and not his peculiar personal appearance which had made him end his life. Now it's true that many men might have found life unendurable if possessed of the peculiar physical features of Arthur Jermyn, but he'd been a poet and a scholar. He hadn't minded that. Learning was in his blood, for his great-grandfather, Sir Robert Jermyn Bart, had been an anthropologist of note, whilst his great-great-great-grandfather, Sir Wade Jermyn, was one of the earliest explorers of the Congo and had written learnedly of its tribes, animals and supposed antiquities. Sir Wade had possessed an intellectual zeal amounting almost to a mania, and his Bizarre conjectures of a prehistoric white Congolese civilization earned him much ridicule when his book Observation on the Several Parts of Africa was published. In 1765, this fearless explorer had been placed in a madhouse in Huntingdon. Madness was in all the Germans, and people were glad that there weren't many of them. The line put forth no branches, and Arthur was the last of it. If he had not been one dreads to think what he would have done when the object in the box had been revealed to him. The Germans never seemed to look right. You know, something was always amiss in their appearance, although Arthur was the worst, and, and the old family portraits in German house showed fine faces enough before Sir Wade's time. But certainly the madness began with Sir Wade, whose wild stories of Africa were at once the delight and the terror of his few friends. It showed in his collection of trophies and specimens, which were, were not such as a normal man would accumulate and preserve. And it appeared strikingly in the oriental seclusion in which he kept his wife. The latter, he had said, was the daughter of a Portuguese trader, who he had met in Africa, and she did not like English ways. She, with her infant son, born in Africa, had accompanied him back from the second and longest of his trips, and had gone with him on the third and last, never to return. Now, no one had ever seen her closely, not even the servants, for her disposition had been violent and singular. During her brief stay at German house, she had occupied a remote wing and was waited on by her husband alone. Sir Wade was indeed most peculiar in his solicitude for his family, for when he returned to Africa, he would pin it no one to care for his son, save for a loathsome native woman from Guinea. Upon coming back after the, the death of Lady Jermyn, he himself assumed complete care for the boy. But you see, it was the talk of Sir Wade, especially when he was in his cups, which chiefly led his friends to deem him mad. In a, a rational age like the 18th century, it was unwise for a man of learning to talk about wild sights and strange scenes beneath a Congo moon, of gigantic walls and pillars of a forgotten city crumbling and vine-grown, and of damp, silent stone steps leading interminably down into the darkness of abysmal treasure vaults and inconceivable catacombs. Especially, it was unwise, to rave of the living things that might haunt such a place, of creatures half of the jungle and half of the impiously aged city, fabulous creatures which even a Pliny 
might describe with scepticism. Things that might have sprung up after the great apes had overrun the dying city with the, the walls and the pillars, the vaults and the, the weird carvings. And yet, after he came home from his last trip to Africa, Sir Wade would speak of such matters with a shudderingly uncanny zest, mostly after his third glass at the knight's head, boasting of what he'd found in the jungle and of how he'd dwelt among terrible ruins known only to him, and finally he'd spoken of the living things in such a manner that he was taken to the madhouse. He'd in fact shown little regret when shut into the barred room at Huntingdon, for his mind moved curiously. Ever since his son had commenced to grow out of infancy, he'd liked his home less and less, till at last he seemed to positively dread it. The knight's head had been his headquarters, and when he was confined he expressed some vague gratitude as if for protection. Three years later, he was dead. Wade's son, Philip, was a highly peculiar person. Despite a strong physical resemblance to his father, his appearance and conduct were in many particulars so coarse that he was universally shunned. And although he did not inherit the madness which was feared by some, he was densely stupid and given to brief periods of uncontrollable violence. And in frame, he, he was small but intensely powerful, and he was of, of incredible agility. Twelve years after succeeding to his title, he married the daughter of his gamekeeper, a person said to be of gypsy extraction, but before his son was born, he joined the navy as a common sailor, completing the general disgust which his habits and misalliance had begun. After the, the close of the American War, he was heard of as a sailor on a merchantman in the African trade, having a reputation for feats of strength and climbing, but finally disappearing one night as his ship lay off the Congo coast. In the son of Sir Philip German, the now accepted family peculiarity took a strange and fatal turn. He was tall and fairly handsome, with a sort of weird eastern grace, despite some slight oddities of proportion. And Robert German began life as a scholar and an investigator. It was he who first studied the, the vast collection of relics which his mad grandfather had bought from Africa, and he who made the family name as celebrated in ethnology as it had been in exploration. In 1815, Sir Robert Wade married a daughter of the seventh Viscount Brighthome, and was subsequently blessed with three children, the eldest and youngest of whom were never publicly seen on account of deformities in mind and body. Now, saddened by these misfortunes, the scientist sought relief in work, and he made two long expeditions to the interior of Africa. In 1849, his second son, Neville, who was a singularly repellent person, and he seemed to combine the, the surliness of Philip German with the hauteur of the Brighthomes, Neville ran away with a dancer, but was pardoned upon his return the following year. He came back to German House a widower with an infant son, Alfred, who was one day to be the father of Arthur German. Friends said that it was this series of griefs which unhinged the mind of Sir Robert German, but it was probably merely a bit of African folklore which caused the final disaster. You see, the elderly scholar had been collecting legends of the Onga tribes near the field of his grandfather's and his own explorations, hoping in some way to account for Sir Wade's wild tales of a lost city, peopled by strange hybrid creatures. A certain consistency in the strange papers of his ancestor suggested that the, the madman's imagination might have been stimulated by native myths. And, on October the 19th, 1852, the explorer Samuel Seaton called at German House with a manuscript of notes collected from among the Ongers, believing that certain legends of a grey city of white apes ruled by a white god might prove valuable to the ethnologist. In his conversation, he, he probably supplied many additional details, the nature of which will never be known, because a hideous series of tragedies suddenly burst into being. When Sir Robert German emerged from his library, he left behind him the strangled corpse of the explorer, and before he could be restrained, 
he'd put an end to all three of his children, the two who were never seen and the son who had run away. Neville German, in fact, died in the successful defence of his own two-year-old son, who had apparently been included in the old man's murderous rampage. Sir Robert himself, after repeated attempts at suicide and a stubborn refusal to utter a single articulate sound, died of apoplexy in the second year of his confinement. And so Sir Alfred German was a baronet before his fourth birthday. His tastes, however, never matched his title. At 20, he had joined a band of music hall performers, and at 36, he had deserted his wife and child to travel with an itinerant, itinerant American circus. His end was very revolting. Among the animals in the exhibition with which he travelled was a huge bull gorilla of lighter colour than the average, a surprisingly tractable beast of much popularity with the performers. With this gorilla, Alfred German was singularly fascinated, and on many occasions the two would eye each other for long periods through the, the intervening bars. Eventually German asked and obtained permission to train the animal, astonishing audiences and his fellow performers alike with his success. One morning in Chicago, as the gorilla and Alfred German were rehearsing an exceedingly clever boxing match, the former delivered a blow of more than usual force, hurting both the body and the dignity of the amateur trainer. Of what followed, members of the greatest show on earth do not like to speak. They did not expect to hear Sir Alfred German emit a shrill, inhuman scream or to see him seize his clumsy antagonist with both hands, dash it to the floor of the cage, and bite fiendishly at his hairy throat. Now the gorilla was caught off its guard, but not for long, and before anything could be done by the regular trainer, the body which had belonged to a baronet was beyond recognition. Arthur German was the son of... Sir Alfred German, and a musical singer of unknown origin. And when the husband and father deserted his family, the mother had taken the child to German house, where there was none left to object to her presence. Now, she was not without notions of what a, a nobleman's dignity should be, and she saw to it that her son received the best education which limited money could provide. Now, the, the, the family resources were by this time sadly slender, and German house had fallen into disrepair. But young Arthur loved the, the old edifice and its contents. I mean, he was not like any other German who'd ever lived, because he was a poet and a dreamer. So, so some of the neighbouring family who'd heard tales of old Sir Wade German's unseen Portuguese wife declared that her Latin blood must be showing itself. But most people nearly sneered at his artistic sensitivity and attributed it to his music hall mother. The poetic delicacy of Arthur German was all the more remarkable because of his uncouth personal appearance. Now, as I've said, most of the Germans had possessed a a subtly odd and repellent cast, but Arthur's case was very striking. Now, it, it, it's hard to say just what he resembled, but his expression, you know, his, his facial angle, the length of his arms, gave a thrill of repulsion to anyone who met him for the first time. But it, you see, it was the mind and character of Arthur German which atoned for his aspect. Gifted and learned, he took the highest honours at Oxford, and he seemed likely to redeem the intellectual fame of his family. Although of poetic rather than scientific temperament, he planned to continue the work of his forefathers in African ethnology and antiquities, using the wonderful but strange collection of Sir Wade. Now, with his fanciful mind, he, he thought often of the, the prehistoric civilization which the, the mad explorer had so implicitly believed, and he would weave himself tale after tale about the, the silent jungle mentioned in Wade's wilder notes and paragraphs. He had a particular fascination with the nebulous utterances concerning a nameless, unsuspected race of jungle hybrids, and speculating on the possible basis of such a fancy, he sought to obtain light among the more recent data gleaned by his great-grandfather and Samuel Seaton among the Ongers. 
In 1911, after the death of his mother, Sir Arthur Jermyn determined to pursue his investigations to the utmost extent. Selling a portion of his estate to finance the expedition, he sailed for the Congo, and having arranged guides with the Belgian authorities, he spent a year in the Onga and Khan country, finding data beyond the highest of his expectations. Among the Kaliris he met was an aged chief called Moanu, who possessed not only a highly retentive memory, but a singular degree of intelligence and interest in the old legends. Now, this ancient fellow confirmed every tale which Jermyn had heard, adding his own account of the stone city and the white apes as it had been told to him. According to Moanu, the grey city and the hybrid creatures were no more, having been annihilated by the warlike Umangus many years ago. This tribe, after destroying most of the edifices and killing the inhabitants, had carried off this stuffed goddess, which had been the, the object of their quest. The white ape goddess, which the, the strange beings worshipped, and which was held by Congo tradition to be the form of one who had reigned as a princess among them. Now, just what the white ape-like creatures could have been, Moano himself had no idea, but he thought that they had been the original builders of the ruined city. I mean, German himself could form no conjecture, but by close questioning, he obtained a very picturesque legend of the stuffed goddess. The ape princess, it was said, had become the consort of a great white god who had come out of the West. For a long time, they had reigned over the city together, but when they had a son, all three of them had gone away. Later, the god and princess had returned, and upon the death of the princess, her divine husband had mummified the body and enshrined it in a vast house of stone where it was worshipped. Then he departed alone. The legend at this point seemed to present three variants. According to one story, nothing further happened save that the, the stuffed goddess became a symbol of supremacy, a symbol of supremacy for whatever tribe might possess it, and it was for that reason that the Umbangus had carried it off. A second story told of a god's return and his death at the feet of his enshrined wife. A third told of the return of the sun now grown to manhood or apehood or godhood, as the case may be, yet unconscious of his identity. Now, of the reality of the jungle city, described by Sir Wade, Arthur Jermyn had no further doubt, and he was hardly astonished when, in early 18, 1912, he came upon what was left of it. I mean, the size of it must have been exaggerated in the legends, but the stones lying about proved that it was no mere village. Unfortunately, no, no carvings could be found, and the, the small size of the expedition prevented them clearing the, the one visible passageway that seemed to lead down into the system of vaults which uh, Wade had mentioned. The, the white apes and the, the stuffed goddess were discussed with all the native chiefs of the region, but it remained for a European to improve on the data offered by old Moanu. Monsieur the Hiron. Belgian agent at a trading post in the Congo believed that he could not only locate but obtain the stuffed goddess, of which he had vaguely heard, since the, the once mighty Umbangus were now the servants of King Alba's government, and with but little persuasion he was confident that they could be induced to part with the gruesome deity that they had carried off. When Sir Germain and German sailed for England, therefore, it was with the exultant probability that he would, within a few months, receive a priceless ethnological relic that confirmed the wildest of his great-great-great-grandfather's narratives. Now, while he waited as patiently as he could for the expected box on Monsieur Verheiren, Arthur German studied the manuscripts left by his mad ancestor with increased diligence, and he he began to feel closely akin to Sir Wade, and to seek relics of his personal life in England, as well as that of his African exploits. I mean, oral accounts of the mysterious and secluded wife had been numerous, but nothing tangible of her stay at German House remained. I mean, German wondered what, what circumstances could possibly have prompted such an effacement, and he decided that the husband's insanity 
was probably the prime cause. His great-great-great-grandmother, he recalled, was said to have been the daughter of a Portuguese trader in Africa. No doubt her practical heritage and superficial knowledge of the dark continent had, had caused her to flout Sir Wade's tales of the interior, a thing which such a man would not be likely to forgive. She died in Africa, perhaps dragged thither by a husband determined to prove what he had told. Well, he says... As German indulged in these reflections, he, he could not but smile at their futility a century and a half after the death of both his strange progenitors. In June 1913, a letter arrived from Monsieur Verheiren telling of the finding of the stuffed goddess. It was, the Belgian averred, a most extraordinary object, quite beyond the power of a layman to classify. Now, whether it was human or simian, only a scientist could determine, and the process of determination would be greatly hampered by its imperfect condition. Time and the Congo climate are not kind to mummies, especially when their preparation is as amateurish as seems to have been the case here. Around the creature's neck, he said, had been found a golden chain bearing an empty locket on which were armorial designs. No doubt, said Monsieur Verheiren, some hapless traveller's keepsake taken by the Umbangus and hung upon the goddess as a charm. In commenting on the contour of the mummy's face, the Belgian suggested a whimsical comparison, or rather expressed a humorous wonder as just how it would strike his correspondent. But, but he was too much interested scientifically to waste many words in levity. The stuffed goddess, he wrote, would arrive duly packed about a month after the receipt of the letter. And the box object was delivered to German House on the afternoon of August the 3rd, 1913. It was conveyed immediately to the, the large chamber which housed the collection of African specimens arranged by Sir Robert and Arthur. What ensued can be best gathered from the, the tales of the servants and from things and papers later examined. I mean, of, of the various accounts, that of aged Soames, the family butler, is the, the most ample and coherent. According to this trustworthy man, Sir Arthur Jermyn dismissed everyone from the room before opening the box, although the instant sound of hammer and chisel showed that he did not delay the operation. Nothing was heard for some time. Just how long, Soames cannot exactly estimate. But it was certainly less than a quarter of an hour later that the horrible scream, undoubtedly in German's voice, was heard. Immediately afterwards, Sir Arthur emerged from the room, rushing frantically towards the front of the house as if pursued by some hideous enemy. The expression on his face, which was ghastly enough in repose, was beyond all description. At the front door, he seemed to think of something and turned back in his flight, finally disappearing down the stairs into the cellar. The servants watched, dumbfounded at the head of the stairs, but their master did not return. The smell of oil was all that came up from the regions below. After dark... A rattling was heard at the door leading from the cellar into the courtyard, and a stable boy saw Arthur Jermyn, glistening from head to foot with oil and redolent of that fluid, steal furtively out and vanish onto the black moor surrounding the house. Then, in an exultation of supreme horror, everyone saw the end. A spark appeared on the moor, a flame arose, and a pillar of human fire reached to the heavens. The house of German was no more. Now, the reason why Arthur German's charred fragments were not collected and buried lies in what was found afterward, principally the thing in the box. The, the stuffed goddess was a nauseous sight indeed. It was withered and eaten away, but it was clearly a mummified white ape of some unknown species, less hairy than any recorded variety, and infinitely, shockingly, nearer mankind. I mean, the detailed description would be, would be simply unpleasant. 
but two salient particulars must be told because they, they fit in revoltingly with certain notes of Sir Wade German's African expeditions and with the, the Congolese legends of the White God and the Ape Princess. And the two particulars in question are these. The arms on the golden locket about the creature's neck were the German arms and the Choco suggestion of Monsieur the Hiron about a certain resemblance to the shriveled face applied with vivid, ghastly and unnatural horror to none other than the sensitive Arthur German, great, great, great grandson of Sir Wade German and an unknown wife. Members of the Royal Anthropological Institute burned the thing immediately and they threw the locket into a well. And to this day, some of them will not even admit that Arthur German ever existed. <laughs>